Greetings, I'm Anuj Marotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and I am delighted to welcome all of you to this is an amazing live from Churchill War Rooms in London. Thank you all for being here despite, and this is George Shock's business, and I'm so delighted that to see you all despite the strike, despite the weather. I think there was rain and whatnot, and some of you have traveled for hours to cover the 15 minute distance, so I'm really, truly delighted to be here. And also I'm joined by many colleagues from the university. Thank you also for being here today. Let me introduce uh, not one, but three distinguished guests today. Uh, to my left here is Christine Brown Quinn, Amazon number one best-selling author, founder of Career Consultancy, the female capitalist, and member of the GW School of Business Board of Advisors. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Next to her is Dr. Slim Feriani, CEO of the Sovereign Fund of uh, Djibouti. Thank you for being here today as Thank well. You. And Christophe de Torrens, the head of business development at Long Harbor and GW School of Business Board of Advisors as well, member. Thank you all for being here. Our topic today, by the way, is how business can take on the world's most pressing challenges. We expect to solve all of the world's problems tonight. We will focus, uh, however, on four significant challenges around the topics of ESG, DEI, innovation and technology, and emerging geopolitical trends. These are topics which I feel are on the minds of most CEOs, and it's good to have a great, great uh, panel here to be able to discuss these. So let me start with you, Christophe, if I may, since you are sitting far away from me, uh, probably hiding, so let me start with you. Against the backdrop of inflation and continuing war in Europe, what can you tell us about the macroeconomic trends you are seeing in the private equity fundraising world? Well, maybe to, to put, it, put it into context, so Long Harbor is a private equity firm uh, with about $4 billion of eight, uh, assets under management. Um, we're based in the UK. We invest mostly in the UK, but are now branching out into continental Europe. Um, so, I mean, obviously the inflation um, that we've, we've witnessed is, is nothing, nothing surprising. Um, it's something that has been expected. Um, but uh, the corollary, and part of the reason is obviously uh, as, a, as a corollary to, to the COVID uh, and the massive influx of capital of, 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 uh, from you know, uh, government intervention. So we, the corollary is obviously now interest rates are going up, so that's pretty, bringing a lot of uncertainty. Um, we don't know uh, what is going to happen next. It's in the hands of government. So, so for us, in terms of uh, investments, um, we, uh, we always have to you know, calculate our investment returns versus what you can get from the government bonds. It's essentially a spread, and it's uh, the risk-free rate. Um, the risk-free rate has gone from negative in Europe to close to zero in the US to way above, above that. It's been a sea change. And so as a result of, of that, we are now re need to reassess a lot of our investments. Um, the corollary to that has been is that some of our uh, fellow investors have had uh, some really tough time uh, as of late. Uh, certain sectors have suffered tremendous uh, uh, devaluation, you know, technology, for instance. But uh, others have proven to be extremely resilient, like infrastructure. Um, so. The, and you know, let's not forget that once you invest, you've got to, the capital has to go from somewhere, and a lot of the capital that we are managing comes from most institutions, but also private individuals. And as investors are now contemplating the world with with the higher interest rates and higher inflation, there's a lot more choice today than you had a year ago. A year ago, if you were in a negative interest environment, you, uh, you, you know you don't want to hold cash. You you need you have a pressure to invest. Today, with interest rates at four, five percent, you have a lot more options as an investor, and therefore, for us as private equity, uh, you know, managers, we have to try to make it much more appealing for the investors for them to come to us. So, so it's been a quite an interesting development uh, as of late. But one thing to be said is we concentrate on, on major markets. We don't invest in emerging markets because that's a has a different t t dynamics. And I know some of the member. Of, uh, the, of the audience uh, specialize in, in emerging markets, but we just stick to it to uh, OECD markets because it, you already remove a lot of the macro political and macroeconomic risk away from the equation. It's already very, very complicated to invest. So, you know, emerging markets or in smaller markets are, are you know, it's a different dynamics. I'd actually be very interested to hear 
what Slim has to say on that. Small point. is beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Christoph, you know, thank you for that. But during the, um, our previous George Cox business, when we, we talked a little bit about the importance of ESG yes. as a key demand for investors and about investment making an impact on society, yes. uh, whether it is uh, renewable energy or carbon neutral or carbon negative for some of the you know, investments. So can you talk a little bit about the latest trends you are seeing related to ESG investing? Sure. Well, let me make, first thing, as an invest, investment house, ESG has to be profitable. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. So, uh, and, and, and the, profit, the way you calculate the profitability, is, you know, everybody knows IR is multiple of equity, but you also have to think about uh, other externalities, which are before we ignored. Um, and, and, and so there's been amazing strides in, tr in trying to capture, to understand what externalities mean and how do you, you be measure those externalities. So one of the things that we've done along Harbor, we established about tw uh, 13 years ago, a, uh, an ESG consultancy called Longevity Partners. Uh, it's now active in 41 countries. We've got 350 odd uh, you know, members of staff. And we advise essentially on ESG uh, criteria uh, for investments for, uh, you know, based on, on, on Bream and based on, on Gresby and, and other uh, matrix uh, and advise those investors that really have no clue because uh, the issue that we're facing with ESG is that there has been a lot of greenwashing up to now. Mm -hmm. um, that is no longer permissible. You really have to demonstrate that by your investing, you make an impactful change. And whether it's in your buildings, whether it's in your companies, whether it is in whatever you do, you have to measure and give an account to your investors of what you are doing and the impact you're making. And the only way to go about it is in, it's a form of indexation having quali uh, quantitative measurements. Qualitative is obviously important, but if you don't have any quantitative measures, it's all blah, blah. And so that's been a really a big change uh, as of late. And so obviously we benefit from that uh, through mm -hmm. longevity. And the business, you know, every year, the staff has doubled. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's been just a huge growth. Um, and the other example I'd like to, um, the other thing that we obviously are very focused is on dec decarbonization. Of, of, uh, of the real estate footprint. We invest a lot in, in real estate. Mm -hmm. So there are two things that we've done. Number one, uh, we have bought a power station in the south of England called Foley, which was the biggest building in the UK. Um, we knocked it down and we're creating a new town. It's a 2.6 billion pound project and it will be surrounded by a marina. Um, and the, the impact is basically to move assets from the carbon uh, the carbon, uh, uh, you know, century to the more technology century, the digital century, but also the ESG century, which is the 21st century, and all these built-out environments will is following guidelines that are very precise in terms of emissions. We want zero emissions. We obviously uh, guidelines in terms of uh, of digit digitalization. All the uh, the entire assets, uh, the, or the entire you know town, which will have six and a half thousand people, will be digitalized. And we'll be using this data to monitor the flows, the ins and outs of the town. So, uh, and that is to, uh, to make, make the entire uh, city much more optimal than, than a normal city. So those are just examples of, of the things that we are getting into and obviously attracting investors because it's kind of beyond, beyond, you know, beyond the norm from, from last century. We need to move the, uh, we are moving actually the needle of, invest, of investing into the ESG sector and we're not the only one doing that. Yeah. Well, I think you know the big takeaway that, that I got from there is that ESG has to be profitable for it yes. to attract uh, investments. Let me continue with this theme a little bit, but maybe move on to you, Slim, to talk about your Djibouti Sovereign Wealth Fund and how it is helping to foster sustainable development goals, investment goals. Uh, perhaps also if you could tell a little bit about um, you know, the vision and how these goals uh, impact the investment and business future in Africa. Great. Well, thank you very much, Muj, uh, for, uh, for the invitation. Thank you to everyone who invited us. It's a great pleasure to uh, reunite with um, the GW spirit. A lot of positive energy. Um, now, um, obviously, uh, I think this is a very broad theme. And um, if we talk about uh, ESG, it brings me back to my days when 20-something years ago, we talked about SRI, Social Responsible Investing, mm -hmm. uh, which evolved a bit into the ESG, Environmental Social and Governance. Uh, issues, 
Uh, then impact investing, which all goes to the same direction, I think. Uh, we talk a lot about SDGs today. We mm -hmm. said sustainable, development, sustainable investment goals, but I think the UN has set up these uh, 17 SDGs. But in the end, it's all you know, to make an impact. That's the way I view it. And uh, anything related to Africa, whether it's Djibouti as one of the 54 countries or anything in Africa that anyone would consider doing, I think is about impact investing, social, uh, I think uh, governance issues, um, and the environmental side of things. Of course, you know, uh, the green transition is a must do, and I can touch on that in terms of the um, solar. Uh, but the impact, I think, in terms of ESG overall on Djibouti and broader Africa, has got to be in terms of investments. That's my view. So mm. it's not, grants are nice. Um, aid, charity are all nice, all, always nice and welcome. But the game changer has got to be investment. That's the sustainable way to make an impact on, 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 on Djibouti and the rest of uh, Africa. And ultimately, it has to be obviously inclusive and sustainable prosperity. That's what we all aim for when we talk about lots of things. ESG, I think most of the investment houses today with the private, all the asset classes, um, long only hedge funds, private equity, sovereign wealth funds, ESG has got to be somewhere in there. And the investors are uh, pushing more for it. So, um, and it's good. It's, at the end of the day, we're doing something good on the environmental side of things or the um, social side of things. Uh, G in ESG, I think, is important also. Some people don't necessarily get the importance of it. It's more about the environment, the social. But the G, good governance ultimately leads to good investments and sustainable investments. And I think this is something that uh, doesn't get enough, I think, airtime um, in the ESG. Um, when it comes to Djibouti, uh, I can talk for hours. I'm very <laughs> passionate about it. Uh, I mean, I, I we have time. <laughs> yes. This is me, a captive me, me, audience at this point. We have time. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I made it all the way here. I scheduled everything to be here. But um, uh, Djibouti as a country is a hidden gem. I go back to small is beautiful, I think, and nice things come in small packages. Um, but uh, it has these five yearly plans and it has the Vision 2035. So vision is important. So Vision 2035 for some looks a bit too far away, but it's important to have a vision. And the five yearly plans, as we speak now, there's a five yearly plan called Djibouti EC. Sounds very French. But ICI, I for inclusion or inclusiveness, uh, C for connectivity, and I for institutions. And that's where the governance side of things. And it all connects to also the UN 17 SDGs, whether it's um, ending poverty, ending hunger, uh, gender equality, uh, quality education, reduced inequalities, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and access to clean and affordable energy. But worldwide, uh, I think we have to also, given that we are between friends, <coughs> we have to also be responsible, I think, for lots of things. You said we're going to sort out all the problems. I hope we can start tonight. Uh, with the gap between the haves and the have-nots, uh, there's a huge gap between mm -hmm. the haves and the have-nots worldwide. Countrywide, I mean, in the US we see it, lots of homeless, etc. But worldwide, I think the, the gap has become morally and ethically unacceptable, if I could put it that way and bluntly and candidly. Uh, and I take Africa as a continent. Mm -hmm. the, gaps between the gap between Africa and the rest of the world is just gigantic, more than yeah. ever, which should be the other way around. <laughs> we should be closing that gap, not, uh, not the other way around. Um, and Africa also has been, I believe, uh, unfairly treated in general. Mm -hmm last hundred years or so, obviously there's been colonization, then post-colonization, well, then you're on your own, you've got to do things. In the meantime, if you don't move forward, you go backwards automatically. And the whole world kept moving forward in terms of the um, developed world. So it's been a continent that's been neglected with 1.4 billion people. That's a lot of people to feed, et cetera, et cetera. So the 1.4 billion is not stopping there. It's growing by 300 million people every decade. So another US population is created I mean, Ethiopia, right next door to, uh, to Djibouti, grows by 3 million people a year. So that's 30 million every, every 10 years. And going to 2.45 billion in no time, in about, about two decades or so, going to 4 billion by the end of this um, century. So it's, it's, it's mind-boggling numbers. And you've got to take care of all those people. Because if you don't address that issue of the demographics and make it a demographic dividend and a positive thing, then it will have an impact on the rest of the world. And this is where we have, we're hearing a lot of things about immigration now into Europe, et cetera. Surely, if you have 1.4 billion people who are not well off, they want to go somewhere else, north or whatever. So I think it has to be a collective, collective effort to sort out issues that uh, uh, Africa has inherited. And that we talk a lot about uh, zero carbon and all of that. But the developed world has developed with pollution. 
So today, being wearing the hat of Djibouti Sovereign Wealth Fund, I have an issue when we are told, you know, we've got to be careful about pollution. But how do we industrialize that? So I think, you know, uh, the, the, the two levels of, uh, of comparison and um, how, how people have industrialized, and we are also hearing a lot about um, China is getting too involved, mm -hmm. surely. The only military base in the world from China is in Djibouti. So, you know, mm -hmm. luck is good sometimes. So the geographical location, beautiful beaches, by the way. So you're all invited <laughs> to visit. Uh, amazing, amazing islands like the Maldives, but all not developed, it's all very, which is great for some who don't want any development, but you've got to do some development in the tourism sector. So uh, what, what the, the issue I'd like to touch on also here is, so China, yes, is involved in all over Africa. So we're told, in general, a lot of people say, oh, well, you've got to you know, open up to others. But if others are not coming in, what do you do? You can't, you can't just sit there and wait. So if, if China is very proactive, I think the burden is on the rest of the world to be even more proactive. And therefore, diversity is important. So yes, we have the French military bases, the American, China's, Japan, etc. Now, that is good for security. It gives a lot of safety for, for, for the country, for the whole region. It all started with uh, the issues of pirates in that part of the world. So that part of the world that goes to the Red Sea, goes to the canals, a lot of, a third of global trade goes through there. So if you have pirates, you know, taken over the ships, so that's hurt the Japanese. So that's why all these military bases were built there to protect economics, protect business, protect trade. Uh, in the end, Djibouti is a beneficiary because they pay all um, a lot of revenues and we get 20% of those as a sovereign wealth fund, which is great. So uh, that's part of our cash flows. But uh, going back, um, I think, in terms of the ESG and what it involves and what it involves and, and the impact, it's all about the economy in the end. Politics are important, social stability is important, but as President Clinton, I was at GW when he became president, it's the economy, stupid, who was able to uh, beat George Bush back then. So uh, yes, political stability, social stability are important, but economic stability is what makes the whole difference. And they all go hand in hand. You may have you know, great social stability, but if poverty kicks in, then you're not gonna get the um, uh, the political stability in the end. And we go back to inclusive, sustainable prosperity. That's the best way to get in. So, so hearing your answer here, three reflections on that. One, I'm very mm. glad that you're continuing the tradition of using acronyms like ICI, et cetera, that you <laughs> must have spent some time in DC. <laughs> Clearly, uh, our number one ranking in international business Absolutely. is very evident. It's because of folks like this who are able to provide this. And our panel, of course, today is very international. And and, the, and, 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 and you know, and, and finally, I think, um, you know, I hope you are all getting some accents there too, so really have a global presence here today. But let me continue uh, with, with Christine on, the, on, on this topic, and let's tackle the, you know, uh, the, the social dimension of ESG a little bit, as it relates to closing the uh, gender gap. So, you know, we are, Christine, in the Women's, um, you know, History Month, and it marks a call for really, call to action for accelerating gender parity. If I am correct, according to 2022 Global Gender Gap Report published by the World Economic Forum, gender parity is not recovering. In fact, it will take more than 100 years to close that global gender gap. So I want to talk about how can we accelerate this progress? Well, thank you for the question, Anuj. And thank you to my panelists, Christophe and, and Slim. You've really set this up well for me. I think that the focus on uh, what's good for business makes the change. So changes have to be profitable and also sustainable. So I'm, I'm absolutely in that camp. So I guess I'm, I'm covering the S and the SG. And for me, it's a, it's, a business, it, it's a business issue. I think in terms of that number, it's a really depressing number, but if I focus on the developed world, the first thing I would say is that we need to take a business approach to gender diversity. And what I mean by that is it can't be like a sideshow CSR. It has to be integrated into the business case. And it's very similar to what you were saying, Christoph, in terms of when you're looking at investments. You know, it's the same thing. So for businesses, they need to figure out, okay, for gender, what's the business case? And it's not a separate issue. It needs to be integrated throughout. So building the business case, developing the program. I mean, this is, this is you know, really, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you cover this in some of your, your courses, Anish. Um, embedding the program, measuring results, of course measuring results. Um, and the interesting thing about this framework, you know, it's very much a business framework. 
uh, it's the same framework for tackling climate change. And so what's really interesting around uh, International Women's Day is that actually that's where the two come together. Again, with climate change, it can't be a separate, you know, a separate initiative. It has to go through the whole business. And when it's not, that's when you don't get businesses don't get credibility. Greenwashing, right? The same thing with gender. Like people are not stupid if they don't really see that gender is part of everything that we do. I know, Dean, with the Diversity Council, you mentioned a lot on our meetings. It has to be in everything that we do, not just one thing. So that's what I would say to begin with. It's a, it's, it really is that business approach. And now that you're all sitting comfortably in your chairs, I'm going to kind of push you a little bit here. It also has to do with leadership. So for those organizations where you're leading, you know, and especially the C-suite and boards, you, know, you have to answer the question, well, why does it matter to us? And how will we change? And how fast will we change? You know, these are really, you know, that's the level we need to be thinking about that. And also with ESG, it's not a, like an, a, an either or. You know, the gen, it's the same thing with, with gender and climate change. It's both and. And if we don't think about the ESG, it's kind of like what I call the Kodak problem, where you're just focusing on the revenue today. But what does the revenue look like tomorrow? And that sustainability piece, right? And I think without bringing the gender, without bringing the climate change issues into the business, you're not going to have those, those future revenue streams. I think that the, uh, the other point here is the sustainability. So the future, sustainability. And we talk so much about employee engagement. You know, how fantastic is it to work for a fund or, or the longevity fund or the Djibouti fund where you're, you're making an impact on the future. Uh, and it, it really, I do a lot of work with organizations and, and thinking about, okay, well, how do, we, how do we recruit that talent? How do we retain that talent? It's about engagement. So my message is really, this is, this is business stuff. This isn't a sideshow. And I think the more that we can think about how we bring these issues into what we're doing today, it will solve a lot of our issues. Excellent. So I mentioned after, uh, after Slim's uh, um, comment that we were number one in international business in the US, uh, I want to follow up with another number one ranking that we have. And I think as businesses start thinking about these, we are producing. Uh, we are number one in the country in the US uh, for percentage of women in the MBA program. <laughs> So that's another number one ranking for you there for all the audience as well. Christine, let me follow up a little bit on this in a different direction, though. Um, you know, data also suggests that the entrepreneurs are extremely underrepresented as recipients of uh, venture capital. Can you give us your insight on how we can increase um, the equity and access for female entrepreneurs? Yeah, I love the question. You know, it's very, very uh, specific and direct. I think first it's important a little context setting. So, um, and let me focus first on the UK. So in the UK, I mean, there is progress in terms of female entrepreneurship. So in 2022, 20% 20 of all the incorporations that have happened in the UK were actually female led. And that was up from 16% in 2018. So you think about it, that's also the pandemic years. Um, also in, in 2022, 150,000 businesses were established that were female-led. The problem with that is the rate that men are establishing the businesses is twice that, but still it's a good number. Okay, so what's the, what's the challenge? So it definitely is access to funding, but I would also like to, to point out that it's also access to markets. So it's those connections to local markets, to global markets, and that enables the, the female entrepreneurs then to scale. The cha okay, so what's, the, what's, the, what's the, the problem here? The problem is VC capital, only 2% goes to females, and that's both the UK and the US. So if I focus on the UK, okay, you can say, well, this is, a, this is an equality issue. This is an economic issue. It, again, focusing on the UK, if we had increased the, the number of female entrepreneurs, you know, the estimate by NatWest, which is doing a lot in this field, uh, that could contribute 250 billion pounds to the UK economy. So 
you know, that, that's why it matters. It's not, it's not just an equality issue, it's an, it's an economic issue. So, okay, how, how do we fix that? I think one of the issues with the whole, you know, gender is it's complicated. And for businesses, it's not, okay, you do this action and you solve the problem. It's multi-layered, right? There's a lot of different factors in there. So here, here are a number of, of suggestions. So the first one is investment panels, that they be diverse. I might mention that the new venture competition at GW, which has the, one of the largest prize monies for US University, um, which has a lot of business students, we have a diverse, a, a diverse panel there. Um, currently, only 12% of the decision makers on those panels are female. So that's one thing. In the UK, there's a thing called the Investing in Women Code. And this was set up uh, not too long ago, I think it's 2019, voluntary. And what I would say of the 160-ish members, 130 approximately are VC funds. And what they're, what they're doing is they're actively, this is all voluntary, they're actively <coughs> setting up measures to figure out, okay, how do we increase the funding to the female entrepreneurs? And I think that's where you start. You have to start focusing, raise the issue, and, and focus on it. Uh, what does that, you know, what, what does that look like, investing in, in, in women funds? So I mentioned about, you know, it, it's adopting practices that improve access. Um, it's also uh, providing uh, funding to just look at the data in a disaggregated way, so male, female. Another suggestion. There's, you know, how about we create more female-led uh, VCs? I know from our dinner last night, I, I heard from one of our dinner guests that, that actually female-led VCs not only will support female-led businesses at a higher rate, but also other diverse businesses. So that's also another initiative within the UK um, called Women Backing Women that are looking to increase the number of female investors and, and women angel investments. Uh, so it was really interesting getting the invitation to this session because I actually didn't know of all of these kind of voluntary uh, measures. Let me just mention two other quick ones. Um, another one is setting up investment vehicles that focus on female entrepreneurs. Uh, for instance, HSBC announced the launch of a billion female entrepreneurship fund. I know L'Oreal has a fund. Um, and then I would say lastly, you know, going back to that question of, okay, yes, it's funding, but also access to markets. And there are associations, voluntary organizations that focus just on that, making those connections. Because you need that, uh, you need to, the access to those markets to get the income that then you have more capital to invest in your business, et cetera. So, so to scale, yes, it's funding, but also it's growing your market. Great. Th those are great suggestions, Christine. And you mentioned the venture competition at GW. You'll also be proud to know that we also now have a BS in entrepreneurship uh, that we, are, we have started, as well as uh, we have a very in in exciting initiative in play where we are working with the Golden Triangle mm -hmm. Business Improvement District and the DC government to launch a Penn West Equity and Innovation District. Um, so let me, uh, Christoph, you've had a long break, so let me get back to you here. Um, you know, I would love to know your thoughts, especially as it relates to you know, raising capital for a new venture. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of early investi investing trends? Well, I mean, private markets is, um, it has grown a lot in the last uh, 30 years. It was a, basically, in private markets was a niche industry. And now um, the private markets every year raises about close to two trillion dollars globally, um, and within that venture, which we define as early stage to uh, pre-IPO uh, or pre, you know, a small, is um, is about ten percent or less than ten percent of, of that. So um, the challenge that we faced last year. Uh, and earlier part of this year is that technology stocks have, have taken a big hit. Uh, so fundraising has been affected massively. Um, last, last quarter, uh, about 26 billion w was raised for, for venture, which is half, less than, less than half of the uh, previous quarter, uh, quarter year ago. 
And, and the other thing, the other tendency is that uh, first time funds have also been, been hit severely. So, so there's a move from investors to go away from venture into other asset, uh, asset classes. Again, as the interest rates have risen, there's, there's more choice for investors. And secondly, to back less, uh, to back more, uh, actually investors are backing more, um, you know, people with track record and people who can prove, prove, their, prove, their, their, prove their, bench, their, their platform. So it's uh, a little less risk taking in, in the market right now. So that's been, I would say it has been the, the trend, but uh, that is currently. Now, if you step out, one of the main, major trends that you see in venture was definitely prop tech, fintech, and health tech have been the absolute overriding winners. And unfortunately, other sectors have been almost ignored. So whether it's development capital for like, Sub-Saharan Africa, which was at some point a theme, that's disappeared. Um, if you have uh, you know, women, uh, women uh, expansion, that has been off the table. I mean, some, some people do it, like L'Oreal. I'm glad you mentioned the, the L'Oreal because they have a great program for female entrepreneurs, particularly in the cosmetics area, and the, in the, uh, which have been amazing. But uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, themes that have been put off the table because there's been a focus right now on, on, on these three themes, which is prop tech, health tech, and, and, and fintech. Uh, now, things are changing in venture all the time. Um, but in terms of, uh, and in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the other thing to, to remember is that most of the fundraising is done in the US. Uh, Europe is, is, is getting there, but uh, uh, venture fundraising for uh, emerging markets or for Asia is extremely difficult. Uh, it's just not very dev developed. So uh, there's some exceptions like Israel, which has been an amazing market, but it's small. Um, but generally, uh, generally, most of the fundraising and the available capital is in, is in the US. So if you've got a bright idea, even if you are located outside the US, you're better off, better off going to the US, whether it's in DC, in New York, or Silicon Valley. Um, then, so the, the, other thing, the other thing is, uh, is to remember is also the, the move from private to public, so the IPO market, that has proven to be much more costly than it was even 30 years ago. The regulatory environment is extremely, more, extremely costly. So if you have a, if, uh, so when you're a venture capitalist, you want to do something, uh, you want to grow your business, and you think, okay, well, I want to do an IPO. Well, not everybody's a Tesla. Not everybody is a uh, is an Amazon. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know very very good entrepreneurs with very good platforms are stuck because the availability of capital is limited or the, the, the options of raising equity is limited. So I think that that is the, the, the main problem that we have right now mm -hmm. in, in venture. Uh, and, and but on the buyout side, uh, the other the, there's a problem on the other end is like the super large buyouts are having a real problem right now. So most of the focus is essentially in mid, uh, small mid-sized companies, particularly mid-sized companies. There's a slew of transactions in the US and in Europe, a lot of capital pour, being poured. And these are businesses with 100 million of enterprise value all the way to a couple of billion, you know, pre-IPO usually. And there's a lot of capital chasing for a few deals. So despite the fact that, um, that with interest rates rising and, uh, and you know, uh, and, and this, uh, this, the wall of capital has supported values in uh, in, in, the, in the mid in the in the, in the mid, sort of the mid the mid cap. Uh, in a venture, some of the values have been destroyed. So we are basically uh, have had a you know it's, well things are going to evolve over time, but right now what we are what we are concerned is about investor is that we want to make sure that when we invest today we have value tomorrow, uh, or actually in, in five to seven years because it does take time. Um, so right now we find ventures start to be much more attractive because valuations have gone down, but there's a risk. There's a very fundamental risk. So, um, so I would say warning. The other thing is, so to remember with venture, is venture takes a long time. You know, everybody thinks, oh, it's a quick buck. No, venture, you start a business, it could take 20 years. Uh, buyouts, you know, the investments five to seven years, uh, sometimes 10 years. And it's, it's, so you've got a lot more turnover on the buyout side than you have in tech. In tech, uh, you know, you've got to support those businesses and sometimes you know, you've got a big J curve before you, before you meet your returns. 
And as you know, it's, it's also the, the lottery of, of, of venture. You basically uh, invest in 100 companies. One may do fantastically well, and that fantastic will support all the other investments which have not done so well, or sometimes are write-offs. That is the risk you're taking. So I think that ratio has, has proven to be quite consistent, whatever you are in the cycle. And today, I think being, being with all the, all the all the, the you know these parameters that we see with interest rates, with inflation, etc., that explains why tech right now, particularly venture in tech, has, has suffered because there's alternatives. And I, as an investor, I, I would put something in venture, but I would not put all my money in venture. So that is going to change at some point. Why? Because interest rates are definitely going to drop at some point as inflation is going to get tamed, and so venture is going to come back. So it's probably a good time now to look at venture. You know, on a contrarian basis, but most investors will not do it like that. Most investors will be quite conservative. So, I think that I hope that answers your question. No, thank you very much for that, and 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 you know that that's great. Um, but Slim, uh, you had mentioned um, that vision is very important, and you talked about the Djibouti vision for 2035. What is the role of startups in that vision? Uh, <clears throat> Well, obviously, um, having a sovereign fund gives us that luxury of being long-term. This is a great, great luxury because um, investing in the short term is, is a very tricky business. Uh, so Vision 2035, again, it goes back to leadership. I think this is a word that was used by Christina. I think we need to emphasize it because um, having a vision requires a visionary and wise leader. And that's the case for Djibouti, having a president like that who can look beyond the next five, ten years. Because as we know, Politics means you know elections on a regular basis, and therefore people don't end up taking a 10, 15 year view. They look at the next election. So in this case, I think we have that luxury of having a wise, visionary leader who set up the vision. Then you have to execute. So uh, obviously you need people uh, to execute, women and men, women in particular. I have a daughter, I have a wife, and a mother. So gender equality is important. You're just saying that you're sitting next to me. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, you know, uh, SDGs is one of those, but I have a vested interest in making mm -hmm. sure that my daughter is well looked it's after. Yeah, she is in the audience, market, though. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so going back to, so that vision requires leadership, and then it's our job then, I mean, we're one of the stakeholders to execute that vision uh, as a sovereign wealth fund. And this is also part of taking matters in your own hand as a country, because you can wait for the rest of the world to come in and invest and do things, but it depends on the cycle. So having your own uh, engines of growth um, allows you to do things. So sovereign fund of Djibouti is just like any other uh, sovereign wealth fund. It's all about having a savings pot for the future generations, for the future. So it's multi-assets, all the asset classes, all equities, private equity, venture capital, uh, fixed income, real estate, etc. Uh, multi-sector, all the sectors that we could have, and multi-geographies. Now, the startup world in, in this whole ecosystem, therefore, looks a bit small now within that whole portfolio, but you've got to do your bit. So mm -hmm. we, we play our part also, and we encourage heavily uh, the startup world, as uh, I think some of you have checked out our website or our LinkedIn page. So we've invested with them with a startup uh, recently in the uh, energy efficiency space. and. Uh, this is part of what we do, but what we can do more of in a more efficient way is launching crowdfunding platforms. So this is one thing also that's innovative. It's fintech, you know, it's very sexy fintech, so financial technology. But crowdfunding is a new thing, and we're launching the first crowdfunding platform in, in, in Djibouti sometime this year as, as the leader of this initiative. Now, that will allow us to actually help a lot more people in the startup world, in the innovation space, uh, and I've, I've discovered really the, the the dot-com world back in the late 90s, yeah. and I remember the NASDAQ and all of that. So we've had cycles, but in this day and age, the developing world, and again, has a lot to catch up to do in there. So the developed world, and uh, we've seen it, you know, with the NASDAQs of this world, but in, in places like Africa, but Djibouti, there's this new energy. But what we need to do really is work on the mindset. It's yeah. Changing that mindset, because the mindset is the game changer in terms of most of the people in the developing world, they would like to work for someone. They would like to work in the public sector. It's good, but not everyone can work in the public sector. It should be the other way around. It should be the private sector that's leading the growth, that creates the wealth. And that's, we've seen that in many countries, like in Singapore, etc. And our, our model is inspired, the business model is inspired by Singapore because of the location, the world-class sports activities. That's the main engine, but our role as a sovereign wealth fund is to diversify that into data centers, into technology. We have 
nine subsea cables, a lot of hidden gems. Uh, and the country, as a country, it's a hidden gem. But the startup world is fascinating. So obviously, having been double minister back in Tunisia for a few years, uh, in charge of industry, SMEs, etc., uh, I know that this is where the future is. So we are pushing also a lot of that in Djibouti via this crowdfunding platform, which will help us also select. I mean, we've done a VC kind of competition, etc., but that, that is not our main focus. Our focus is big scale stuff. So we need to scale things up and allow vehicles like crowdfunding platforms to do that. And, uh, and that will, those startups and entrepreneurs of today, because the, word, the, the buzzword you use and think the magic word is entrepreneurship. You gotta have that entrepreneurial spirit to make things. Otherwise, I mean, not everyone can be an entrepreneur and take risk, because investing is taking risk. There's right. nothing easy to do. So you invest, you take a risk. You launch your own thing, you take a risk. Now the statistics say, you know, 10 to 20% max of the startups survive past the two years. So yeah. those first two years are crucial. So I strongly believe that we need to have the ecosystem in there to hold the hands of the young entrepreneurs, the startups. And that's what we've done with Jib Energy and quite a few other uh, women-led, actually, startups. Fascinating. Uh, and, um, and so that's, I think, you know, what I would like to say along those lines in terms yeah. of the startup world is part of our ecosystem. We will play our role in a multidimensional way, not just one way. We can't be just in the selected, but we'll invest in VC funds also. So we're talking to VC funds because that's another way to uh, actually have a bigger impact on because we can't yeah. select 10, 10 small startups. It won't move the needle for the whole country, but we can invest in VC funds in the Djibouti or uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or developing world, and then we'll get you know uh, that impact also locally and regionally and continentally. But the crowdfunding platform, I think, is one way to get change the game for many of the uh, startups and the entrepreneurs in Djibouti. Can I just pick up on the the gender point, especially um, in the developing world? So so obviously bringing in the female entrepreneurs, you're raising the whole economic level of a country. But there are also so many studies that show that when a woman makes money, she invests it back into her family and the community. So the ripple effect of that, I think, is really, really powerful. And the microcredit space yeah, exactly. actually is very much heavily yes. driven by women in Djibouti yeah, and many parts of Africa. So that's a good point. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, that's just a classic example of, I mean, microfinancing is a very profitable business. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the, the credit worthiness of the women in terms of them paying back is extraordinary. So yeah. I think that's, that's, you know, people might think, oh, well, this is about charity or whatever. Microfinancing is a business. Absolutely. I know we are close to, you know, end of the time here, but I do want, if there is a one or two questions, if you can raise your hands, I'll get, get to you in, in after this question. But let me give you a question, Christine. Uh, particularly as you're talking about entrepreneurship, and that's what we are discussing here. Um, you know, uh, what advice would you share about the risk taking for women, and uh, any person actually who has to really navigate the barriers of inclusion in 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 the workplace as an entrepreneur, having written the best-selling, you're the best-selling author of the Unlock Your Career Success, knowing the unwritten rules change everything. So would love to hear your thoughts as a final question. For so, the so I would say that the important thing, especially, especially for females, is to talk about what you're doing. So whether it's in a corporate environment or a risk-taking environment, people are not mind readers. So, so my book about the, the rules of, of, of business and career success, the unwritten rules, they apply to all of us. We, and, and an example of that is self-promotion. We have to talk about what we're doing. And I think for, for females, we don't like to brag. Um, it doesn't, it's not a thing that comes natural. So you have to find a way of talking about the business and what you're doing in a way that feels natural. But you're clearly sharing with others of your own vision and, and you know, what, what you're trying to achieve. So that would be my number one uh, advice. And I think on the organizational side and on the leadership side, is to recognize that talent looks different in, in different people. And so, you know, it may not be the person that comes banging on your door for that opportunity that says, you know, I want this. Th maybe they're not the most qualified. You just need to have that kind of extra sense to say, well, you know, maybe who's not putting up their hand who actually could do the role as well. So I'm always one for individual empowerment, but I think as leaders we can, we can help the subject as well. Great. Any one question from the audience? Anybody wants to ask one, one question? 
All right, in that case, you know, I think they're ready for the glass of wine there instead, so <laughs> we'll, we'll take it there. But I, I wanna say thank you also to the University Alumni Network, and this is, a, this is an event that we are co-hosting with them, and I thank the panel, the distinguished panel. This was a great conversation. Indeed. And for all of you, I hope you will continue to watch our George Talks business show. It is on YouTube, and you should be able to watch them on a regular basis. And we will uh, also be, I hope, we are actually organizing a very important event on April 25th around the area of cybersecurity. This is a business and policy forum that will be live streamed as well. This will be an amazing one where we have a lot of different industry leaders, not just from, but, you know, from Verizon, from Deloitte, from Microsoft, Google, uh, and Mosaic and whatnot, and also many policy leaders from the government all in one day, and it'll be a very proud moment for GW. So if you are not, if you are traveling, please register and come over in person. And if you are watching from here, it will be live streamed. Thank you again, all of you for joining tonight. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.